Welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of APSATS, the Association of Partners of Sex Addict Trauma Specialists, hosted by Dr. Jake Porter. APSATS is a nonprofit organization providing professional training and compassionate support to partners affected by problematic sexual behavior and betrayal trauma. In each episode, Dr. Jake guides a conversation of enlightening insights and practical tools to empower those affected by sex addiction and betrayal trauma to use their voices and live their values. The mission of Betrayal Recovery Radio is to offer hope to those in need of healing and growth to those moving through grief. And now, here's your host, Dr. Jake Porter. Welcome to another episode of Betrayal Recovery Radio. I am your host, Dr. Jake Porter, and I'm very excited to um, welcome back to this podcast today, Dr. Crystal Hollenbeck. She is no stranger to this uh, podcast, to Betrayal Recovery Radio, but this is the first time that she's been on since I took the helm from Carol the Coach. So uh, I'm excited for this conversation, and I know you're going to get a lot out of it. It is a sensitive subject, so I do want to warn you up front that we're going to be talking about sex and sexuality and healthy sexuality. In fact, today's topic is establishing and maintaining sexual intimacy in the betrayal healing process. So, you know, if this is if you're early in your process, I absolutely think that there's going to be great information in here that you will benefit from and you'll want to have, but also be gentle with yourself and know your own limits and be willing to turn it off if you're not in a place for this conversation. Um, Dr. Crystal Hollenbeck, though, has a lot of really great things to share, no matter where you are in this process of healing from betrayal. Uh, Dr. Hollenbeck is a certified sex addiction therapist. She's an ASECT certified sex therapist. She's an APSAT certified clinical partner specialist, and she's worked with addicts, partners, and couples in sex addiction and betrayal trauma healing process. She does three-day intensives that are intended by Uh, attended by individuals and couples from all over the United States, Canada, and Europe. She has a compassionate, structured, and directive approach that offers hope to people who are hurting from sexual abuse, addiction, and betrayal. Uh, She has offices in Orlando and Tampa, Florida. She's been here, like I said, many times before on this podcast. She always offers validation, great insights, and great recommendations for betrayed partners uh, from her own experience and expertise in the field of sex therapy and sex addiction therapy. Um, So I hope that you will will take a listen and get a lot out of this. Uh, Before I do move into that conversation with Crystal, Uh, I want to remind you to check out many of the great trainings that APSATS has to offer, both the Keystone uh, Cornerstone training of the multidimensional partner trauma model. Um, There's one actually taking place right now today as this episode is being released, but the next one will be, I believe, in January. Uh, There's a great uh, workshop coming up from Marie Krebs, who is going to be talking about um, finding higher levels of care and referring clients out to higher levels of care. So if you're a professional in the field, there would be great information in that. That's a one-day experience in December. You can go to appsats.org for more information on all of these opportunities and to learn more about this organization. All right, now buckle up, get ready for this great conversation with Dr. Crystal Hollenbeck. Dr. Crystal Hollenbeck, welcome to Betrayal Recovery Radio. Hey, Jake. It's so nice to talk with you. Yes, and I should say welcome back because you are no stranger to this podcast, but it is the first time since I've started hosting, so I'm really excited to have you here. Me too. Yeah. So before we get into um, you know, the, the main topic here, I usually like to make sure people get to know our speakers at a little different level. And you let me know that your real claim to fame isn't necessarily sex addiction expert and sex therapist, but that you're Gigi. Is that right? Gigi to your grandson and that you and him have an outstanding history of fort building. Hey, it's set up upstairs. It takes up the entire room and we love to go in there and (laughs) 
together. He's five and he's so much fun. So oh. we are walkie talkies and we go in there and turn on our flashlight and do, uh, we love to do mazes together and play checkers. Oh, that uh, is so, so fun. fun. He's the love of my life. He's just so adorable. Oh, that's, that's amazing. It actually, I, I got a little bit emotional. Uh, my gram, my grandmother passed away. Uh, last month and but I have memories of building forts with her when I was little and getting in there and playing so I know you're making really good uh, memories with him oh, helping him have that secure attachment that's yes. great yes, yes. And that brings tears to my eyes I'm sorry you lost your sweet oh, grandmother I'm glad thank you have you. those precious memories me too lots of good lots of good ones I'm, I'm glad I get to carry well today though we are going to be talking about um, the impact that sexual betrayal and sex addiction can have on sexuality, particularly for the partners of those who've been betrayed, right? And how to yeah. get back to healthy sexuality. Mm -hmm. And this is something you're particularly suited for because you're not just a sex addiction therapist. You're also an ASEC certified sex therapist. Can you just, let's just start by helping our audience understand the difference. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So being an ASEC certified sex therapist means I've already met the criteria to be a certified sex therapist for the state of Florida. And then ASEC is a national certified sex therapist uh, certification. So that covers all areas of sexuality. With a certified sex addiction therapist, that is a focus on the problematic sexual behaviors, the sexual betrayal, the compulsivity, these acting in ways using um, unhealthy sexual behaviors, mindsets, fantasies in a way that really causes disturbances in your life, uh, causes you to betray people that you love. So I have both. And what I love to do is I love to encourage people right from the beginning of treatment to say, we are at a place of unhealthy sexuality right now, but we are definitely going to move to a place of healthy. It is possible. You can recover from betrayal. You can grow and discover and explore a healthy sex life together uh, with healing. So that's the differences. That's awesome. And I really appreciate people like you who kind of have one foot in both of those worlds because a common criticism of, of CSATs and sex addiction therapists is that we're sex negative, right? But, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're one of the voices overcoming that saying from the get go, no, we want healthy sex, <laughs> right? In, yes. involved. Yeah. Yeah. And also ASEC certification really helps you to focus on the individual, right? The individual mm -hmm. person, the individual couple, which is where we want to focus to say, not only am I going to help guide you with some, some boundaries around what healthy sexuality should look like, but what does healthy sexuality mean to you? Because that could right. also be different for everyone. So it's not a cookie cutter process. And those who are struggling with sex addiction, um, those who are struggling to um, heal from sexual betrayal, right? We also want to value you as an individual. What's mm. okay and not okay for you? What's your idea? And we take a look at everything from how you, those um, meanings of sexuality that were taught to you as a child, to your own history of sexuality, to exploring and learning what do you want to look at healthy sexuality being? Um, and, you know, probably the number one thing for couples, if they forget everything else we talk about today, Jake, is it's so important to talk about sexuality. Right. It's important to talk about sexual health. And the number of people I see that just never talk about it is really the core issue. And it can be uncomfortable and it can be scary. Um, mm -hmm. But that is what we want to focus on. We want to start the conversations, first of all, about what's unhealthy and causing heartbreak and damage to ourselves and our relationships. And then let's start taking a look at what would look like for it to be healthy and walking in integrity. Oh, that's great. And I just want to encourage any listeners, you're maybe I'm thinking of, of someone who might be kind of fresh off discovery and you're going, I'm not ready to hear this. Well, that that's okay. But I would also say there, there's going to be something you want to hear in here because I, because I know the direction this conversation's going, this is important. And I know that, uh, uh, our guest today has a lot of good stuff to share. So let's jump in with this question. 
Um, what are some of the most common ways that you see a betrayed partner being impacted sexually, specifically by the betrayal? Oh, there's so many ways, right? First of all, they're shocked. Sometimes a partner will be in a relationship with their husband where they're not being sexual. And sometimes the partner is engaging three and four times a week, sometimes daily. So it can be so confusing. Um, also, one of the greatest impacts I see is the comparison, feeling mm. like I'm not good enough. Why was I not enough? Um, the impact that of adultery, right? Our wedding vows have now been violated. What does yes. that mean, right? And the pain of that, they can't look at their wedding pictures. Their wedding night, oftentimes people have been virgins and they get married and now they realize, oh my goodness, he was betraying me before we got married and I didn't know. Um, he lied to me and, you know, so everything about their sexuality can be impacted negatively. You know, they can think sometimes they're so traumatized they can want to go out and have a one night stand or do something that's unhealthy sexually because right. they're just so confused. Like their whole world is turned upside down sexually. Sometimes they'll be very hypersexual. They'll want to have sex with their husband constantly and do all kinds of things maybe they didn't do before. So they can feel very desperate. And then some just say, I never want to have sex again. I don't want him touching me. I don't want him near me. So all their whole person is impacted, but specifically sexually, you're really confused. Yeah. And, you know, I appreciate you bringing up how there's, there's sort of those two responses that look so different. The person who says, do not touch me never again. And then the person who, like you said, becomes hypersexual, who, who is wanting more than they used to. And it's so important to normalize that partner, both of those responses, right? That they're both common and understandable mm -hmm. uh, reactions. You are so right. I probably use that word more than any other word, right? This is normal. This yeah. is normal because they're feeling so abnormal. They're just, they don't even know who their husband is or their wife is, right? Or their partner, whoever it may be. They're just in shock. It really is traumatic. And so just continuing to let them know, because how many times do our clients say to us, am I crazy? I feel like I'm crazy. I, you know, am I, am I stupid? Am I, and I always say, no, you were deceived. You were mm. deceived. You're not stupid. You're not naive. Right. You were deceived. And this is normal for how you're feeling. Um, yes. And so you're absolutely right. We want them to know this is shocking. It's overwhelming. It's very normal how you're feeling. And we want to move the partner away from shame. It's okay yes. that you have those thoughts. And if you did go do something or say something, it's okay. It's okay. We're going to heal from this. It's going to get better. But you're exactly right. Just normalizing that their world has been turned upside down and they feel that way. Right. And another one you mentioned as you were uh, laying out that, that list was, Maybe that they would want to go out and have a one night stand or, you know, uh, often that's what I, in my experience, when I, when I unpack that, they're wanting the one who hurt them to feel the hurt, not to hurt them, but so they understand the hurt that they're feeling. Right. Oh, you, know, you're you get that. Yeah. <clears throat> Absolutely. That's very common, not just in, I want to go betray you sexually so you know how it feels to be betrayed sexually, but all types of things. You know, one of the things I say to my partners is, if I strung him up on the ceiling right now, and we tied him up and he was helpless and we beat him and we plucked his eyeballs out and we did all kinds of mean, horrible things to him, it's still not going to get him to understand the pain that you feel. No matter what you do to him, he's not going to understand the pain that you feel. The way that he's going to understand it is by him getting a sober, healthy mindset. And then by you sharing how you've been impacted, right? He learns more. The betrayed uh, person, if they share more of, here's how I'm feeling. Here's what this did to me. If they share it in a way of their experience um, the betrayer gets it. 
But when there's anger and I'm going to do this to you or I'm trying to hurt you, really, they get defensive and then they don't meet that need. And so I try to encourage partners. I want you to get your need met. Absolutely. You've been hurt so much. I don't want you to be hurt anymore. So let's start sharing with him what it's like, because I want him to draw close to you and show empathy and understand the depths of what he's done. When there's betraying happening, what's happening in the betrayer's mind is they're minimizing, they're justifying. They, they really, they can't connect to the truth of what they're doing because the pain and the reality of what they're doing, walking outside their character, they're not going to go there. And then, of course, when it becomes addictive patterns and the brain keeps saying, hey, we're normal when we do this. So it's that ugly pattern. It's not till they can stop and start to actually hear. That's why the impact statement is so important to share Mm -hmm. how you've been impacted sexually um, by that. But you're absolutely right. At first, they're so hurt and overwhelmed and their whole world is turned upside down. And when we're hurt, we want to hurt back. Right. right. We want to say something back. We want to do something back. Unfortunately, oftentimes partners will become physically abusive, Mm -hmm. um, hitting. And, you know, we have to, of course, have boundaries for that. I teach them how to calm themselves down, value themselves. um, Because when someone does something to you that's so devastating, you aren't, you don't feel like yourself. Oftentimes I have women say, I feel like I'm watching my life. This can't be my reality right? And of course, in the therapy world, we call that dissociating, where you're you just the pain is so real that you can't uh, connect to it. It is very similar what the betrayer is doing when they're betraying, they can't face the pain of reality of what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. So they live in this fantasy mindset of minimizing and justifying. And, you know, I have one man that said to me, but he's doing great in recovery. And he said to me, he said, Crystal, I actually got to the point that I was telling myself, if she catches me, she'll be okay with it. It won't be that big of a deal to her. Wow. He's like, my mind went so dark and ridiculous of how I was justifying what I was doing out of the fear of being caught, out of the fear of hurting her. Wow. Wow. So, and and let's hone in also, what are some of the sexually related fears then that partners have about their addicted spouse after discovery? Because those come up a lot too. Yeah, they really do. They're afraid that they're going to have a sexually transmitted disease. They're right. afraid that somebody is going to find out. They're yes. afraid that their children are going to find out is, of course, the worst Mm. Um, The worst thing for a woman is their children are going to find out. And of course, we know sometimes the children are the ones that actually discover the betrayals, which is just devastating. Um, They're afraid of getting an STD. They're afraid Mm -hmm. that he has these children with other people that they're not aware of. Right. They're afraid that um, they're not enough. You know, they're afraid that, um, you know, there's just so many fears. They're afraid that their marriage is going to end. They're afraid of financial consequences. They're afraid of, if I have to divorce this person, they get angry and fearful that they're only going to see their children 50% of the time. Yes. So there's all these sexual fears, but then there's real life fears. There's fears related to parenting, society, your faith, right? Um, There's so many fears that women have. And of course, we know that trauma a specifically post-traumatic stress is an anxiety related disorder, right? There's fears. Um, and when you are betrayed, your whole person is betrayed. So you're afraid of a lot of things, right? Also, I've had women tell me, I'm afraid of me. I'm afraid of me oh. now. I'm oh, angry. wow. I'm yeah. so angry. I'm having all these dark thoughts of what I want to do. It's scaring me. Um, you know, They're just afraid that he won't stop acting out. And I've had a lot of women say to me, I'm afraid of who I'm becoming. Wow. And so again, Jake, like you said, we have to normalize that. Fear is normal. Anger is normal. You know, all kinds of dark thoughts are normal. So when you come into therapy, we're going to teach you how to manage those intrusive thoughts of fear, anger, triggers, 
Um, and a trigger is simply that triggers us to remember something. It could be something we see. It could be a word. It could be a name. It could be a, you know, a smell, a right. taste. Um, so yeah, fear is a very big part of when all of this is happening. Wow. And you know, one that, that popped into my mind that I would love to hear you, you talk about that I, I hear a lot is women wonder if I do have sex with him, will I trigger him? If we have sex, how do you, how do you handle that one when it comes up? Boy, that is such a common one. Yes. Yeah. I get asked that probably from every partner. So when we come into treatment, we usually recommend a 90 days of complete abstinence for the betrayer. Right. And so that means no sensual or sexual activity with yourself, with your wife or with anyone else for 90 days, because we want to do a good, lot of good work in those first 90 days. And obviously that's also difficult for the partner because now she's deprived of that sexual connection. Right. And so when we talk about that, that's very common, whether it's right away. Oh, do I stop having sex with him? If I continue, is it going to trigger? But specifically, I hear it a lot around the 90 days ending. Right. Mm. The partner could say, oh, no. So the 90 days are up. He's done so well. If I start having sex with right. him, he's going to start acting out. And this is where education comes in. You know, as therapists, it's really important that we're constantly educating our clients because this is all new to them. And so what I educate them on is that sex addiction, as strange as it sounds, has nothing to do with sex. I, I say that too. And I've had some partners actually kind of get mad at me when I say that at first, but I believe it. So please go on. Yes. Yeah. Say more. Um, it's no different than vodka doesn't have anything to do with being an alcoholic. Right. Mm. And so what's happening is there's multiple things that contribute to the why. And this is so important for the partner and the person that's betraying to be educated on this. Right. It's a complex answer. There's not just one reason. So for the partner, she's, and I'm just using uh, she and he just for an example here, but she is constantly wondering about the why, because if I can figure it out, right. then it won't happen again. And I can, I can keep myself safe. Right. Yes. yes. And when he starts to get sober minded and walking in integrity, he's like, why, why would I do this? Why, why, you know, I'm so ashamed. I'm so embarrassed. And so I educate them on it's a complex answer. Sometimes there's a history of childhood trauma, unhealthy sexuality during your developmental years. Sometimes right. your sexual template is developing in an unhealthy way. The messages that are sent to you about sex, what you're exposed to at a young age. And then what happens is unhealthy patterns. You start to lie and keep a secret, and then it's easier to lie and keep the secrets. Yes. And then the brain starts to develop an addictive pattern where mm. the brain literally is getting a dopamine hit, which triggers the amygdala to say, this is norm. This is what we do. Right. And then it becomes a pattern. Oftentimes you'll hear people say, I didn't even want to do it anymore. And I still found myself doing it. Right. We see in the scriptures, yeah. I see a lot of Christian clients when Paul talks about, I'm doing what I don't want to do and I don't do what I should do, right? That thing that happens in the brain, um, that's where the addiction develops. The addiction doesn't develop right away. It's over a period of time and there's multiple right. things that contribute to it. So a lot of times, um, Alex Kate Hawkins talks about it being a seeking addiction, right? Mm. And doing is you're seeking out that feel good. You're seeking out that um, dopamine hit, so to speak. It's an unhealthy way to cope with life. It's, you know, stepping outside of the reality and the pain of life and looking for a feel good. And, yeah. and this is the addiction process. And even if people don't want to refer to it as addiction, I say you can call it what you would like, right? You can call it chronic betraying. You can call it compulsivity. Mm -hmm. You, right, whatever you want to call it, unhealthy sexuality um, is fine, but the treatment that we have, regardless of what you call it, is the same. And so educating them on that. And once the partner is educated to say, look, it is up to him to walk in integrity and be faithful and transparent and honest and accountable to you sexually. And so that's the work he has to do. What you do or don't do has no impact on what he does. 
sexually, yeah. right? So, and I also in, encourage the partner, Jake, and you probably do the same thing. There's no right or wrong. So if on day 91, you want to be sexual with your husband, it's okay. If you do not, it's okay. That's but right. Again, <laughs> let's talk about it. Let's talk about where you are. Let's keep talking about asking good questions, getting to know each other as to where we are right now. Yeah, that's so well said. Great. So just shifting a little bit here, how difficult is it for a partner to learn about their addicted spouse's sexual behaviors, you know, to not just what happened, but this kind of education that you're talking about, we then have to do after the initial discovery, which is its own learning, right? Traumatic learning. Um, but do you also find difficulty in them then onboarding some of the education that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. It, it's so difficult, right? Now they've stepped into a world that they never thought they would be a part of. Right. They learn things they never even knew existed. And it's yes. horrific to think that this man that I love and admire, the father of my children, this person who um, is so ex respected in the community and um, in his career could be living this secret life. It's just, it's overwhelming. Um, however, this is a very controversial issue, right? Because yes. women will say, well, why do I have to know? I don't want to know. And then they'll say, oh, no, I need to know everything. And what I try to do is get a balance with disclosure. So I want to empower women to say, I understand this is painful, but you need to know who you're married to. You need to have the full truth. The truth is important. I personally don't believe that you can have a healthy relationship without truth. And no. again, people will disagree and say, well, they don't need to know about my sex life before we got married. I disagree with that. I think that you should know each other. I think you should talk about that. You're making a very important decision to get married and commit your life to someone. Even if you're in a committed relationship, I think you should talk about sex before you have sex, right? I think right. I want to know who you are sexually before I decide to give my whole self to you in such an intimate way. So I do believe in the truth. But what I do with disclosure is I empower the partners to say, you want to know the truth so then you can start to heal and go forward. And I want your husband to look you in the eye and tell you the truth because That's there right. can be, in my opinion, no intimacy without honesty. Absolutely. And so the one part that I do try to do in disclosure is I'd be careful of the details that they're giving. They do need to know the sexual acts. They need to know websites and email accounts. They need to know the pattern of behavior um, that their husband was engaging in. They need to know the types of sexuality, whether that was unprotected vaginal intercourse or giving and receiving oral sex. I do believe they need to know the acts. What I try to shield the partner from is things like she had big breasts, any adjectives, any emotions. I liked it. I didn't like it. It was nothing like that at all. We're just giving you the facts and during disclosure, there's no apology or explanation. It's just, I'm going to sit and look you in the face and I'm going to tell you the truth of what I've done. Right. And I shield them. Unfortunately, you know this. Some partners come to us and they've already seen videos and text exchanges and Facebook exchanges. So they've already got all these details in their mind that are so painful. It takes me longer to help a client heal when they've had the details of some of those things. Um, so we do try to do some protection of what's not helpful. It's just hurtful, but we do want you to know the full truth. And if Absolutely. there's something that's really important for you to know, then I try to facilitate talking about why do you need to know that? Why would that be important to you if it's a detail? And if, you know, we talk it through and if it's something really important, then I do ask the, um, betrayer to go ahead and share it with her. So we are here to really help the partner, whatever she needs. But of course, she's looking to us as professionals to give right. her guidance and advice. So, you know, it's not a cookie cutter process. Um, but again, talking about it, I think is so important. Absolutely. You know, one of the, one of the very first disclosures I ever did several years back, um, it, the, the, in the written disclosure, 
the um, addict said that he had acted out with someone in a parking lot and she re really was pushing him for where, which parking lot, which, you know, what, and, and I was like, do you really want to know this? And it turns out and this, and this is like a, a, a tale of warning for any listeners who are thinking how much detail do I want? She, she just pushed, she felt like it was really important and it was a parking lot of a McDonald's. And then for the next two years, every time she saw the golden arches, she had to face this horrible trigger response, mm -hmm. you know? And so, Oh, I just felt for her on that. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. so scary. I, I get it. I understand the need to know. And also the, the having that understanding of how detail can come back to create more pain and trauma longer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you mentioned earlier, um, the impact statement right? That a partner prepares, um, and how that is, is a way to reach, you know, once the addict has a sober mind, how to reach him to help him have some empathy, but it's also important for, for the betrayed partner, the process of preparing it and writing it. Right. Can you speak to why it's important, uh, for them to do that letter, especially around their own sexual healing? Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a couple of reasons why it's so important. <clears throat> First of all, usually the partner, she is, you know, having these outbursts, right? She's crying herself to sleep. She's looking in the mirror and having body image issues now. There's so much going on with her. And she spurts that out sometimes in anger in disgust, or maybe she'll tell a girlfriend, but she doesn't tell her husband. You know, so there's so many parts of this. I think for our own mental well-being, for your mental and emotional, relational, and sexual health, you need to sit down and tell your story. Mm. And so I do that when I see, I do three-day trauma intensive. So I do a lot of trauma work, a lot of sexual healing trauma work. And whether you are healing from sexual abuse or whether you're healing from sexual betrayal, I think it's important that you tell your story. And so part of writing out the impact statement is really telling your story. When you discover this, I have women do it in all different ways. I've had women that have written poems and songs and women that will go back to their wedding day, right? Go back to the first lie that they were told and they're telling their story. That's what the impact statement is. This is how I've been impacted. This is my story. So much focus is on the addict, right? Um, or the betrayer when there's sexual betrayer. And she is trying to say, this is my story. It gives her an opportunity to write out her experience. It gives her the opportunity. I also ask them in the impact statement, have a voice for what you will never put up with again. What's acceptable and not acceptable? What yes. do you expect going forward? Yes. Um, and, and just about every impact statement I do as well, the partner is loving and kind and says, I do love you. I do see the effort, the work that you're doing. I do have hope, you know, so they usually also express something, but it's very important that they just be raw and real and share. This is my story. The second part of it is, I think, I think it's um, essential to the addict's healing. So he gets a copy of that impact statement. And then I start to work on the restitution letter. Mm -hmm. So we do disclosure, which just gives the facts. We do the impact statement where he hears in uh, her story and what he's done to her, right? How it's impacted her. Then in the restitution letter, there's three parts there. He's going to admit what he did. I broke our wedding vows. I put you at risk for STDs. I broke the law, whatever it is, right? He's going to apologize, show remorse. Then he's going to take her impact statement and he's going to use parts of that and really share empathy, understanding, talk from his heart about how he's impacted her. So then she really sees that, oh, he hurt me, right? He does understand. He is showing empathy. And then the third part is here's my commitment to go forward differently. And so it's a beautiful time then after the restitution letter, I start to focus on building and maintaining a healthy marriage. Um, both relational, relational intimacy as well as sexual intimacy. Wow. 
that's that is so well said. I, I agree on every point. That it, it's such a pivotal moment for both of them and and for them as a, as a couple because often this is the first time they've been able to talk about these things. Both of them from a grounded place and grounded doesn't mean you don't have big emotions, mm-hmm. right? But they're both fully there, fully present. Such a powerful, powerful thing. Um, You're so, uh, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go, no, no, go ahead, please. Go ahead. That's something that's so important. I think that's why it's important that we do it in the office of the partner's therapist. If you're not seeing them, sometimes yes. I'll see all three parts. Sometimes I just see the partner or the addict or the couple or, but most of the time I see all three, but we would do it in that setting because I've had so many clients say to me, we could have never had this conversation at home. No. Um, and of course we do our prep work with them. Jake, as you know, we prep it, we provide safety we have them have a safety plan for afterwards. They have support yes. for after that session. But we are there to facilitate. We are there if they get overwhelmed because we yes. want her to have a voice and him mm-hmm. to be able to sit there and be present and look her in the eye and hear it. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say what you said there is so important. Yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely. Um, something else that you mentioned earlier briefly you talked about uh knowing people knowing each other's full sexual histories um not just from the start of the relationship on i i would agree with you on that but speaking specifically to a betrayed partner um you believe a betrayed partner's full sexual history should also be assessed though around the betrayal trauma healing process can you talk about why that's important because mm-hmm. I, I think that's missed. I'm just going to be real bold mm-hmm. here. I think a lot of co- our colleagues are afraid to go there because it's such a tender thing and they, and they don't want it to any way imply that there's some reason or fault on the betrayed partner's part. But I agree. Mm-hmm. It's so critical. Can you speak to that? Yes, Absolutely. I think it's important to do with every client. Actually, I do the same thing with the addict that I do with the partner. We go from birth till today and we take a look at sexual exposure, exposure, sexual mapping, relationships. How did they start? How did they end? What was it like with your parents in the home? What were you taught about sexuality, your sexual experiences? It's so important because not all the time, but often I have Uh, partners who are victims of sexual abuse from childhood. I have partners that came out of homes and they have a pattern of choosing men that don't value them and treat them well. Um, They have their own body image issues. They were taught that they are to service the man, that it's their role to keep him happy sexually. And if he's not, it's their fault. So we have to understand as therapists, what are their beliefs around sex? What is their experience (coughs) around sex? Because I'm empowering both to really have healthy sexuality, to walk in integrity around sex, to have your voice um, and to question. So Mm. many times we don't question right? I want you to question what you were taught. I want you to question how you feel. I want you to question your husband. I want you to question yourself because when we're taking a look at healthy sexuality, the number one thing that I stress is we are both valued. When we are talking about sex and relationship, we are both valued. And so we have to facilitate that. Our experiences are valued, our opinions, and they may be very different that we are both valuable. And so, yes, I agree with you. Um, There may be some shame that comes up for the partner. Oftentimes, um, this is not uh, unhealthy either, that they were very unhealthy before they got married sexually and were both aware of it. Um, But then they thought, when we get married, well, I'll make it different, right? Yeah, that fix everything. (laughs) Yeah. I'll stop acting out. I won't have to then because we'll be married, right? Um, So there's all these things. Also, another very important thing that I've learned, Jake, is there can be some sexual abuse going on within the marriage that has never been spoken. The husband can be acting out porn um, scenes with the wife. He can be coercing her into threesomes and doing things sexually that she's very uncomfortable with. We have to ask those questions. We have to dig a little deeper because sometimes we're the first person that the partner 
says, oh my goodness, I, I just never felt like I could say something to him or anytime I would say something to him, he would tell me that I was a prude or I need to grow up or, you know, I need to be more open. Um, and so just understanding that, that we have to delve in and ask those uncomfortable questions because we have to give them a voice, right? Yes. She's so afraid. You were talking about fear a few minutes ago, right? She's afraid not to please her husband. She's afraid, oh, if I don't do this, then maybe he'll go get it somewhere else. Or if I don't do this, maybe, you know, I won't be enough. And what we have to realize is we have to realize that no is an okay uh, word to say. And you're going to say no to your partner and that's okay. You're going to say yes and no. I always say, don't dwell on the one thing that you're not going to be able to do. Dwell on the 150 things. You can, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Absolutely. So, um, so let's, let's talk more specifically about what healthy sexuality is. Um, right. It's, it's what we're aiming for. It's the goal, you know, from the very beginning, you're saying we want to, we want to make that. Uh, a target down there. So you've, you've got an acrostic. Uh, I, I have it in the show notes here. I think it's great um, for helping betrayed partners establish and maintain their own personal, healthy sexuality. So do you want to share that acrostic? Yes. So that is part of healthy sexuality where I've actually taken the letters and I've gone through um, everything about it. Actually, I have it right here. It's, a sheet that looks there like we go and yes. kind of goes over everything right um and it simply says healing every aspect of yourself leads to the hope and harmony you desire and deserve a support system exercising your mind body and spirit x-raying your thoughts emotions mm. and behaviors understanding of your sexuality a realistic plan with boundaries love for yourself and others Intimacy, both relationally and sexually. Trust, both responsibility and reliability. And then your choices and your consequences, mm. right? And so when I talk about healthy sexuality, again, the first thing that I teach is there has to be some trust established before we can engage sexually. So that's why, Jake, as you know, we address the betrayal part first, and then we right. really focus on healthy sexuality. I don't think yes. it takes as long as people may think. I, I think agree. Doing the work, it doesn't need to take that long to get to a place that you're engaging sexually in a healthy way. Yeah. Um, but what we start with is we are both valued. So I teach mm. healthy communication skills for outside the bedroom, so to speak. And then we're going to use those same communication skills talking about sex, right? So we're both valued. I also teach people don't make sex goal oriented. This is such a common issue. It's not about penis performance or orgasm. It's about having an experience together. It's about the time that you are completely naked. You're completely vulnerable. You're giving your whole self to someone and they are entrusting you with their precious self. So mm. think of it as an experience. I think it should be fun. I think it should be romantic at times. Sometimes it's really special and other times it's a quickie in the kitchen, right? <laughs> but it's this mutual respect and mutual consent is so important and talking about it and learning about your partner, sharing, learning about yourself. So many couples, I, I just can't stress this enough. I know I'm repeating myself, but they don't talk about it. Right. They don't say what I really enjoyed, what I like, what I don't like. Um, I want you to start that journey. I want you to learn about initiation. I think both people should initiate in a healthy relationship. So you want to ask your partner, how do you like me to initiate? Yeah. Right? What does that mean to you? How do I like you to initiate? And of course, I want you to tell them what you don't like. Right. So I want you to be clear if you're asked to do something sexually, I want you to be clear to say, no, I do not want to do that. And please don't ask me again. If it's a no, you know, steadfast, no, make it really clear. Always be kind with your words. And then if it's something you'd like them to stop doing, right, try to preface it with something positive. Try to say, <laughs> you know, I love it when you kiss my neck, but I don't like it when you stick your tongue in my ear. Please don't do that again. 
<laughs> yes. So yeah. We want to try to really just that open communication is the key. And then understanding that the partner will have triggers and there's no timeline on that. And right. so we also have to teach during the acts of sexuality, she can become very triggered. So I do two things. I'm going to teach the partner how to stay present, how to manage those triggers to continue. And then I'm also going to teach the addict how to recognize when she's triggered, what to do in that moment. And of course, it's always okay if we stop and just cuddle and talk, ask for whatever you need, but it's always okay to stop. But if we can work through it and continue, um, then we're going to try to. So we start addressing those things. And I do think it's important, Jake, um, you know, you talked about our colleagues. We've got just the best group of colleagues in this field. I mean, we I'm do. just impressed and admire them um, so much more that I learn about them. However, sometimes they have to really realize you have to stay within your scope of expertise. If you are not trained in sex therapy, if you do not have certifications and training, what I recommend you do is when you get to that place of healthy sexuality, the same thing with trauma, right? Sexual trauma, betrayal trauma. If those are things that maybe you're a coach and you've not been trained, maybe you're a therapist and you've not been trained, go ahead and connect with someone that does have those credentials, refer out for that piece of it. And then you're still the primary therapist. So I have a lot of colleagues that will do that with me. They'll, they'll refer them to me. I'll do some trauma work, some good, healthy sexual uh, training and education and work with them. But then they continue to see their primary therapist outside of that. But if you do not pay attention to that, many couples have gone to marriage therapists and have been harmed instead of helped um, because they're simply not trained around betrayal. Um, they they jump to quickly to let's fix marriage problems when we haven't built the trust. Right. So I don't think it takes that long. I like to get disclosure done within six weeks, if possible. Of course, sometimes it takes longer, but we want to get a treatment plan done immediately that the wife is aware of and has input into start disclosure, start working on the impact statement. We don't rush it, but we're addressing this immediately because we want to keep getting them to a place where we can build and maintain a healthy marriage. Absolutely. Oh, that was, I, all of that was so well said. I appreciate that a lot. So, <clears throat> you know, so I, I want to reflect back to you. You would tell a couple if, uh, listening here and maybe they, maybe they don't have the resources to, to see a therapist every week or, or often, but you would say maybe start with talking to each other. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Start by just beginning to have the conversation, get used to talking about these things, asking questions, sharing your experience. And then I also love where you went next, which was be ready for triggers. Mm -hmm. They're normal. There's that word again, right? They're common, expect them. They're not, the, it's not going to be the end of the world. There is a path forward, right? Yeah. And it's you so know, good. the addict has the triggers too. Right? That's right. So not just the partner. That's right. Um, they both may be triggered. And that openness and communication, partners tell me every day, literally, probably every day I meet with somebody that says, I just feel so close to him when he shares something with me. Mm. Right? Yes. If he shares what he's thinking, if he shares what he's feeling, if he shares an experience, because he's withheld so much from her with betrayal and acting right. out and keeping secrets. It's so important that he share what he likes too. what he does. She wants to know you, right? I feel like that's the most important part of healthy sexuality is I want to know you and I want you to know me on the most intimate level. And it's okay to talk about things that are uncomfortable. It's okay right. if you see something different, right? Maybe you want to hang from the chandelier and I'm like, no, that's not <laughs> for me. And maybe yeah. it's uncomfortable, right? To talk about certain things, but you're exactly right. We've got to talk about them. Um, some good questions to ask Jake would be, um, what were you taught about sexuality? Mm. What was your first sexual experience? What, what did you know about your parents' sexuality? Did you hear them in the other room and you were like, ooh, gross? Um, or did they never show affection in front of you? You right. know, and so start with talking about childhood. Is affection important to you? 
Um, what did you learn about sex? I remember being a child and I literally thought that I would look at people and see how many children they have. And if they had like three children, I would be like, oh, they had sex three times. <laughs> I used to think that sex was connected to having children and that's sure. it. You know, makes sense. And so, yeah. you know, as you look back on things, I remember being in a choir, I think I was 12 or 13 and a girl next to me was talking about sex and she had had sex and she was sharing with another girl. I wasn't in the conversation, but I heard her saying, oh my goodness, it smells so bad. It's like the worst smell you've ever had when you have sex. <laughs> And that stuck with me, right? I thought, oh, when I have sex, I've got to be prepared. It's going to smell really bad because we never talked about sex in our home. Uh, you know, yeah. we just never talked about it. I just had this conversation with my son um, over the weekend. We were together and I said, I wish I would have talked more. Now we talked some, but I wasn't a therapist when I was raising him. I didn't become a therapist until after he went off to college, I went back to school. But I said, I wish we would have talked more openly about mm. sexuality. And uh, he and his wife were here and they said, you know, we agree that both of us, we wish our, that you all would have talked to us more. Yeah. And we definitely are going to have open conversations throughout the yeah. lives of our children. Right. And I encourage that to all people start talking to your children and normalize it. It's a very important part of sexuality. Use appropriate words, right? Call things what they are. Don't give them nicknames. Um, right. be anatomically correct, but talk about it openly, instill your values. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I would teach abstinence, right? Well, you know, don't just say, don't do it. Say why I recommend that you, you understand this is a very important decision that you make in life. Um, right. you know, so talk about what you believe, talk about the feelings. It's normal to desire sex. It's normal to have sexual attraction and sexual arousal. So many people don't talk about masturbation. Talk about masturbation. Talk about these things in your home. Because I really believe if we talk in a healthy way in our homes, it's going to educate. Our children are going to be more prepared for adulthood. I really think it could impact betrayal. I think it can make people coming into adulthood be so much healthier that I really think it's a preventative tool even for unhealthy sexuality Absolutely. later in life. Absolutely. That's so good. So good. Well, as we, as we start to wrap up here, I want to give you an opportunity to just kind of speak directly to our listeners, um, who maybe they're, maybe they're thinking, okay, okay, perhaps I'll start dipping my toe in these waters of, of healthy sexuality. What, what final words would you have for them? I would say value yourself and then value your partner. Hmm. You can have your own boundaries. You can say no to something you're not ready to talk about. That's okay. You can ask a question. And if you get an answer, fine. If you don't respect that person, but I think honoring yourself and I think honoring the other person with boundaries and openness is so important, but have it be ongoing. So it's not like we just talk about it once a month and that was really weird and awkward. And you know, we're not going to talk, you know, how many of us parents have had talks, right? And then we're like, okay, here it comes. Have to do that again, you know, send them, send them to school, let them talk about it at school. You know, it can be awkward. And it's, I always say, get comfortable with it being uncomfortable. It's okay if it's uncomfortable. It's yeah. okay if it's awkward and we laugh and it's quirky and embarrassing. Um, but I really think it grows a deeper sense of intimacy and it gets you to express yourself. So express yourself, share your thoughts and feelings, share your questions. One of the most important parts of healthy sexuality is exploring and discovering together. Yeah. Right. And so you can start that through those good conversations um, together. Wow. So well said. Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you for being here and, and giving of your time to share this valuable information to everyone. I really appreciate you and the work you're doing. Thank you, Jake. You are amazing and you're so dedicated to our field. It's such a pleasure to always talk with you. Thank oh. you so much for having me. You bet. And you'll have to come back soon. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. You've been listening to Betrayal Recovery Radio, the official podcast of AppSats. 
If you've received help or hope from this episode, I encourage you to share it with someone you know. If you've not yet done so, please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite listening platform. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Jake Porter, and you can always email me directly at jake at appsats.org. I'd love to hear your ideas, questions, or comments about the show. Until next time, keep choosing to use your voice and live your values. It's good for you and for this world.